Listen, vision. Listen, vision. Listen, vision. DC's number one recording studio. Oh. Thursday night tea. Thursday night tea. Thursday night tea. It's Thursday night tea with Anthony. Thursday night tea. Thursday night tea. Thursday night tea. It's Thursday night tea with Anthony. Thursday night tea with Anthony. to Thursday Night Tea with Anthony. I am your host, but I have a gracious co-host today with me. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Stephanie Mickle. <laughs> Don't she, I feel like she looks like my aunt. Like, I feel like we could be related. We could be related. I, I feel like we could. Did you do your ancestry DNA? I, well, um, the funny thing is, is um, we're not from, no. I'm from North Carolina. No, we did. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm from North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And my family, I'm from a small town called Mount Airy. Oh, it's uh, yeah. actual, actually Mayberry, where they filmed the Andy Griffith show. Yeah. Uh, it's a real place. Right. Um, and with my family, our lineage traces back to before the Declar- um, the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. And um, it's a weird story, but our uh, ancestors um, gave us all this land and stores and blah, 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 blah. Right. So then we did. Um, when it was before it was popular, we did the ancestry trace, yes, and um, just found all of our lineage. And we normally we have a family reunion every year of okay. like three hundred people. Wow, um, yeah. So and it's wow. it's crazy. So we definitely searched our. Um, and I'll share their album with you because it's super interesting. Please do. So we could be, where are you from? Well, so my father's family is from South Carolina. Oh, I, I used to live in Columbia. Lot. See, yeah, exactly. His mother's from Columbia. Okay. Most of his family's from right outside Columbia, a little place called Camden. Okay, I've heard of Camden. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so I got a lot of family in South Carolina. That's amazing. Yes. Shout out to the Carolina. I know. North and South Car- Kakalaki. Kakalaki. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about more about who you are mm-hmm. and, um, um, all the things that you have going on. She's an amazing lady, and I cannot wait to get into that um, subject matter. But now we're going to talk about our um, topics of the day yes. right after we take this break um, from our sponsors. So uh, if you don't know who our sponsor is, it's Lock Love Salon. Go check them out at www.lovloc.com or Lock Love Styles on Facebook mm-hmm. and Instagram. So we're going to go pay these bills and come right back with more Thursday Night Tea with Anthony. Welcome to Lock Love Salon. We're located at 402 8th Street Northeast, Washington, D.C., right in the heart of the Capitol. Come in. Let me introduce you. Welcome to Lock Love Salon. We here at Lock Love are an award-winning natural hair care salon that focuses on natural hair care and lock artistry. We believe in the inherent beauty of natural hair and take a more of an educational, holistic approach to natural hair to preserve hair quality and assure healthy growth. We have an in-salon marketplace stocked to the core full of essential products to promote healthy hair, which we also use ourselves. All of our stylists are well versed in all things natural hair care. Locks, extensions, flat twist updos, kid styles. We are here to promote your best you. Come to Lock Love so you can be locked in love and we'll see you beyond the red door. Welcome back, welcome back to Thursday Night Tea with Anthony and also with Stephanie. With Stephanie. Hey, I like I it. Know. You can add a new verse. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Stephanie trying to take over okay. my show already. No, listen, already. I just want to be a co-host. Okay, that, Every I, once and again. We can, be, actually, we can actually do that. Okay. That'll be amazing. How fun. Um, we have some super funny and not funny topics today. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to start it off with the cancellation of the Roseanne show. Yes. And this, <laughs> that, <laughs> the thing, okay, as we all know, Roseanne, um, the Roseanne show was canceled yes. after she sent out a very derogatory, racist um, inexcusable. Twitter post, inexcusable, <laughs> abhorrent um, Twitter post. Now, um, we all know who Roseanne is mm-hmm. uh, and her show, even though she was a staunch, uh, Trump supporter, um, the show was uh, rebooted, yep. 
and they got like 18 to 20 million views on mm-hmm. the first mm-hmm. uh, viewing, and it was a juggernaut. Yeah. That was the highest ratings of a family show in four years. Mm-hmm. Um, so ABC thought that they had a hit on their hand. Absolutely. But what they didn't do was take Roseanne's phone out of her hand. Um, you know, I just feel like I was raised on The Cosby Show mm-hmm. and Roseanne. And Roseanne. I, um, to be honest, I loved the show. Yeah. I, I loved, she was fresh, she was honest, um, she pulled no punches. Right. Um, and I'm from, um, I grew up in a small town called Winston-Salem, mm-hmm. and a lot of my surroundings were people, it was a rural surrounding, right. so it was, you know, I could kind of relate mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. Um, just like I could relate to The Cosby Show. The Cosby Show inspired me to do right. more. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to, you know, do my homework, because he made his, he made his, his kids do, his, do their, their homework. homework. You right. know, I wanted to go to college, because Denise went off to college. Right. Roseanne was more of, I can relate. You know, and I can um, identify with this family from mm-hmm. a lower income mm-hmm. stream, mm-hmm. Um, which I'm sure a lot of Americans can relate to. Absolutely, and I think, and, you know, I happen to love Roseanne too. The mm-hmm. first time around, yes, uh, because I thought, you know, wow, this is this is a glimpse into a different part of America. Yes, and what I really liked about what the show did when it came out, why it was so successful, I think why a lot of people liked it across. Uh, racial boundaries was because they were so authentic. Every single family member had an aspect to them that you thought was relatable. Yes. And so that to me was, I think, why it did so well for so long Mm -hmm. and why people were excited about the prospect of it coming back. I think the challenge became twofold. The timing that it came back was coinciding with Trump being elected and and the climate. And and he's such a polarizing figure that for people like myself, we, I was initially skeptical, like, wait a minute, are you kidding me? We're going to have Roseanne as a Trump supporter on the on the show? Yes. That's immediately canceling out some aspects of their audience that wouldn't, you know, would be hesitant to say, OK, I'm going to give it a, a round two uh, because because that ne- automatically, I think, kind of push put up a wall. We debated. <laughs> we debate. I mean, we literally sat on the couch mm-hmm. with the remote like, <laughs> do we really want to watch, watch this, this reboot? Right. And and I feel like we watched like the first episode uh-huh. and um, it was funny, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then to be honest, my conscience would not allow me to, it, you know, that's, that's the really, uh, that really speaks to the crazy time that we're in where entertainment and politics are, have become so intertwined yes. and they used to not be that way. No, they used to be separate. Completely like what you did in separate. your, your private life was totally separate mm-hmm. from your mm-hmm. entertainment life. Right. It's no longer like that it's because of social media, because of social media, because, uh, people in Hollywood are becoming more openly vocal about their politics they certainly did under obama very much so. uh, they used to under uh, pr- prior administrations but it they were more quiet about yes, it. yes i don't right. remember any of them Mm-mm. rallying Mm-mm. for george bush or ronald no, reagan not publicly <laughs> not publicly they may do it they may write big checks but they were not out you know at the protest Even the Clintons, at the march they would show their mild you yes. know uh, appreciation or respect for but it wasn't like an outright vote for bill clinton right 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 so we have in a strange way we have obama to thank for this yes. right Right? Because he's so he's he's so magnetic. He's such a Hollywood type of guy. Very anyway. charismatic. <laughs> he's very, very yes. charismatic, and so you know that he kind of made it cool to come to Washington and be you know. People for the wanted Holly- to do it. They wanted to yes. do it. So we started, and of course here in D.C. we started seeing more and more celebrities yes. around town, which is you know kind of excited for geeky folks like ourselves. So <laughs> <laughs> that you get to see all these celebrities, and so that was a that was a good thing. But back to Roseanne. She got herself in a whole lot of trouble. And see, I just feel like my heart does not go out to Roseanne. My heart goes out to all of the other actors and actresses Mm -hmm. and technical support and Mm -hmm. production assistants and uh, producers Mm -hmm. that are out of a job because of her irresponsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It pains me. It's terrible. It's terrible. She was in a, a moment of recklessness. 
uh, like you said, somebody did not take her phone from her. Yeah, I think I saw something that Tom Arnold, her ex-husband, was like, I've been trying to t- tell her to put that phone down <laughs> yeah, for years. I saw that. I saw that <laughs> so article. You got to listen to the people that know you, right? Yeah, exactly. You do. You do. And someone should have. And I, I feel like even though um, I do feel bad for the staff, it's like, when you lay down with dogs, and I'm not calling Rodan, Rosanna dog, I'm saying this in a proverbial type of mm-hmm. cliche-ish right. um, uh, response, uh, you're going to get fleas. Mm-hmm. So when you associate yourself with certain types of people, you're basically allowing yourself to succumb to the actions that they they do mm-hmm. and the consequences behind those actions. And I think to your point, because Trump has gone out of his way to to cultivate an environment where people feel comfortable saying things that are more racist, saying things that are sexist. I mean, the saying all sorts of he is he is an equal opportunity offender. He offends everybody <laughs> pretty much at, at pretty some much. point. And he's certainly looking for 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 those things that will really kind of push the envelope in terms of what he says. That is encouraging people to say, well, you know what? If he can do it, why can't I? Oh, it emboldens people. Oh, absolutely. It's totally de- um, shout out to Dennis Boss, Joseph Braxton. Shout out to Joseph um, and his book. What's the name of Joseph's book? Still breathing. I'm still breathing. My lungs are still going, Joseph. Shout out to you and your book. Um, what do you guys think about Roseanne? Uh, should it have been canceled? Should it have not? We have other responses. Jason, Jason. So remember she said that she took an Ambien? Oh, wow. So the makers of Ambien, Ambien. responded to her <laughs> and said, people of all races, religions, and nationalities work at Sanofi, which is the, the drug Manufacturer. company. Manufacturer. Yes. Every day to improve the lives of people around the world. While all pharmaceutical treatments have side effects, racism is not a known side effect of any Sanofi medication. Shout out to Sanofi medication. Absolutely. <laughs> I know, and shout out to um, what's Renee. my friend? Yeah, Alex. shout out to for, Renee. For we talk about yes, yeah, she kills that bell. She loves the bell. And yes, shout out to Renee. I'm, and before I used to be like, oh my god, Renee is killing that bell. But then I actually put the bell right here, and I kill it too. So it's like <laughs> we're just gonna kill this get, bell all together. Around. But that was yes. great that they came out and responded to her. People, it's zero tolerance with people these days. Absolutely, like, and it should be right. I mean, because here's the thing: companies like Sanofi, companies like Disney, companies like Amazon have been personally attacked by the president. Yes. You know, so their money is on the line. Their brands are on the line. Their corporate uh, responsibility to all of their customers is on the line. And so absolutely, I think it was the right thing for them to do to come right out and say, and they did it in a tactful and yet funny way. Yes. To say, (laughs) that's not us. (laughs) That's you. (laughs) What's the next uh, image? Jacob. So this is from uh, some of her ca- cast members. And her cast members are not playing with her either. No. They're distancing um, themselves, um, stating that they're not, you know, um, in association with her mm-hmm. and um, that what they worked for is separate from the opinions and actions of one person. But the thing is, when the opinions and actions of the one person is the who show, show. <laughs> who show it is. Yeah. Her name is named for her. That makes it much more difficult for them to be able. They they basically have no choice. It's either I disassociate myself from you in the statements that you've made, or I'm compromising my own career. Just like corporations, these actors and actresses have to think about their next, um, you know, movies, their next plays, their own reputations, their yes. own body of work, and their own personal. Uh, reputations and so you look at someone like Sarah Gilbert who's really famous she's on the talk every day which is a very diverse cast very much so and she said I mean what is she gonna do except disassociate herself of course what's the next uh, image we have Jacob I think it's from her um TV son if I'm not mistaken yes Yes. um we must stand up against bias hatred bigotry and ignorance to make society a better place for us all <clears throat> and I read an article where he said that he was just simply devastated. He is devastated because of exactly what you said. His job, the jobs of all of the supporting uh, team members that work on it. But this is the guy whose child was black on the show. Yes. You know? He said that he was totally embarrassed <laughs> by the the comment. What's our next uh, image? So yes. Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes um, actually 
said that she once she saw the tweet, she quit right then and there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, I I was listening to I think the Breakfast Club yes. with Charlemagne. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the Breakfast Club. Um, mm-hmm. They were he was saying that he really couldn't give Wanda kudos for that because why was Wanda there in the first place? Well, and he can ask that question. Um, from the outside looking in, but you never know people's motivations. Like she could have said, oh, I can make it better. I can be there to, as the black voice, to make sure that it doesn't go awry or, you know, now I'm not excusing her, um, but for me personally, I just would not associate myself with someone like Roseanne. So I guess I see it a little differently. Okay. And, you know, for, for me, I think Wanda, like, she's a comedian, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and she knows her craft. And sometimes they'll bring comedians in to kind of help make Roseanne and John Goodman or the other comedic actors better. Yes. And so, and, and she knew, like yourself and myself, a lot of people, African Americans, liked it the first time around. Yes. They, they were excited about the show the first time around. So she probably felt like, even if it's a Trump supporter, and there were uh, people of all backgrounds who did vote for Trump, including African Americans, yes. she probably felt like, okay, this is a, a, a risk I'm willing to take. But I, clearly, it did not um, <laughs> pan out pan for out. you. <laughs> um, and so Roseanne tweeted later that uh, it was actually Wanda Sykes' fault because when she did the tweet about her not coming back, it made M- ABC nervous. Um, and there are a lot of conspiracy theories that she's throwing up because she's crazy. She she's that, um, Michelle her Obama. Cast, her cast members threw her under the bus. Yes. <laughs> um, Roseanne, you're driving the bus, so nobody can <laughs> nobody can throw you under there because you're driving. You're driving it. You yeah. hopped out and thrown yourself. And now under your the bus, bus has run out of gas. <laughs> Um, so and- that's remarkable to me, and I think it speaks to a bigger problem: is that we have in this country a lack of accountability, and and it, it is becoming more and more popular to not take accountability for your behavior. So when you see a Roseanne, first she blames the drugs, then she blames, I mean, the medication she was on, then she blames Wanda Sykes. I'm, you know, I'm sure she's going to blame somebody else at some Michelle point. Michelle Obama. She blames Michelle Obama. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, and, and we see the same thing with Trump. Trump is blaming everybody except himself yes. for the actions that he's done. And, and How we, self-centered do you have to be? Now, this is Roseanne's issue. He went <laughs> and said... Um, I think you owe me an apology. Me an apology. <laughs> Just like you owe, you need to celebrate me on Veterans Day. I mean, Memorial Day. We need a parade for we me. We need a parade for me. With millions I'm of dollars I'm going to refer spent. to myself in the third well, person. We have so many homeless veterans here that that money could go towards. And, and so many people that are dealing with mental health issues yes. and they need work. And there's just so many things that we, you know, and I do want to say since we are just coming off of Memorial Day, thank you so much. Yes, for your, for service. your service. Yes. Thank Shout out to so all much. the veterans. Absolutely. We love you. Absolutely. We appreciate thank you for everything your you do to keep us safe, uh, for sure. Yes, definitely. What was the next um, image we had? Um, oh, that oh, was a remake. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so you went there. Let's yeah, talk about definitely it. <laughs> went there with uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders um, as Darlene, which she makes a great Darlene. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like Kanye as DJ <laughs> for some reason, and I definitely don't like um, what you call it as Jackie. What's Kelly her name? Conway oh, she's the worst. It's Jackie. Yo, that is hilarious. And That's I like crazy. John Goodman. I don't like Trump playing against John Goodman. No. Sarah Huckabee, if they offered her, told her the White House, the doors are open for her, she wanted to come. Well, they told Roseanne that. Yeah. yeah. Roseanne. Like, what is she going to do at the White well, House? anyone that works there? <laughs> <laughs> this is the bigger point. True. You know, I mean, when Kim Kardashian goes to the White House to discuss prison reform with zero experience None. in any type of anything. Anything. Any type of anything. Now, I will say this. As somebody who's been doing this a very long time, people become advocates for an issue from various walks of life. Uh, a lot of times they have a personal connection to a story. They have a child or a family member that uh, is affected by something, mm-hmm. and then they become then then they get up to speed. They start learning all the data, the statistics, and that type of thing. That's different than the people who are professional experts who that's all they do all day long is make sure that they know the numbers. Uh, but it, it, and, and but I think that that's a different thing than a celebrity choosing a cause for the purpose of extending their celebrity. Now, I'm going to just say it. That's what I saw this as. I don't oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, there are 
literally two reality stars meeting in, in the, White the White House. House. <laughs> I mean, right. it has become a living reality show over there. You know what? And I think, you know, as, as Americans, we all have a responsibility to think about very seriously what we want our reputation to be in the world. Um, you know, even though it may not, what happens across the pond, what happens around the world does, may not directly affect us. Uh, it, it speaks volumes when we, you know, agree and allow, agree tacitly and allow stuff like this to go on unchecked. Yeah, we need to check it. Check, 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 check yeah. it. What's the next image we have, Jacob? <laughs> yes. That's barbecue Becky. Barbecue Becky. Yeah, she's giving a phone call. What's the next image we have? Uh, let's. It's it. Okay, so um, moving on, we're gonna talk about the spike in violent crimes in D.C. in Chicago. Yes. Um, in Chicago over the Memorial Day week, I think we have a, an image. Um, nine killed, twenty nine wounded in Chicago shootings over the Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. Um. There's, you know, there are a lot of theories as to why the, we're seeing these spikes and shootings. Um, but, you know, there's certainly something to be said for people having other things to do, outlets that are productive and positive uh, so that they don't get into these situations where tempers flare is hot, um, aggravated, and next thing you know, there's a shooting that's happened. Um, and then I also think that, you know, one thing we want to keep in mind is that there's theories out there. I think um, uh, Harvard Medical School did a study, I believe it's Harvard Medical School, that this is a contagion. There are, there are cities that are starting to treat this massive gun violence that happens in our inner cities as being contagious, almost like a contagious disease. I can see that, though. Yeah. I can see the, the mindset behind that. Um, I feel like when you, I feel like it is contagious. I mean, I'm, I'm processing it. I was mm -hmm. processing it as you were saying mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Like, right. what is it going to take? Right. So, so, right. So it's not that I want to be a shooter, but if you're shooting at me, what am I going to do? Or if I'm in an environment where day in and day out, I'm seeing people getting shot, then I'm thinking at, on some level, I need to get a gun and I need to be prepared when this happens, and not I need to protect my happens. family, and I need to and protect my family, and you know, and then you get into you know that, and that's the rational aspect of us just being human beings. But then, if you put on top of that ego, the heat, hormones, frustrations, <sighs> drugs, you know, right, being out, being you know, your mind altered state, revenge. Yes. And, you know, before uh, I was looking at it and, you know, I was like, wow, this is in Chicago. But here we are having the same issue. Yes. Um, I think the next picture is of the... Um, D.C. Thing, yep, D.C. Um, four killed and nine others injured in a burst of weekend shootings. Uh, and that was over the Memorial Day weekend. As well. Um, I saw uh, an interview where... And I don't think that it was really fair the way the interviewer was, the reporter was trying to attack um, Mayor Bowser. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? People want answers, right? And this that's what she was, <laughs> and she was, I think that the answer, I mean, it's a dual-edged sword because she was asking for statistical information and right. she was like, oh, well, here's the chief of police who has those answers for you and right. you can relate that question. But right. she was like, but the question that she asked her was, when you built your campaign mm -hmm. on the um, lowering of violent crimes, mm -hmm. how do you feel that it's actually the antithesis of that? Now, she could have answered that question because that goes directly to her and her campaign. Right. Uh, but she was, like, trying to, like, skirt the issue. Trying to skirt the issue. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's a fair question, it right? It is a fair if, question. If, if that's a major part of your platform, then certainly it, the, it it stands to reason that you've thought through how you want to, to execute something like that, especially in an um, in inner city, a major city, major metropolitan area where you know this is a problem. It's going to continue to be an issue unless you have some really clear strategies for how you want to address it. And then you can point to the numbers. You can say, okay, we increased police patrols in these, at, in these locations. We changed this. We added summer programs for children who were more likely to get into involved in Which mischief important mm -hmm. intramural sports or yes. activities after school programs um, community centers recreation centers 
I just don't. We should have a cornucopia of them. Children Absolutely. should never have nothing to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you kidding me? The way I was raised, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there was you, always something to do. I mean, I was involved in so <laughs> many things in school clubs. Mm-hmm. I mean, after school activities, intramural sports, and I'm not even a sports player, but because it was the culture back then, it was the culture. I would stay after for kickball right. or soccer or, you know, things of that nature. But those, they're removing those things from schools now. And the thing is, most teachers most long-time educators will tell you that children are more focused when they have more outlets, when their minds are challenged in different ways, when they can get up and run, or go to the playground and run around or do some type of physical activity, whether, when they can play music or learn about something new, go on a field trip. So if, if they need all of that type of stimulation during the school year, they certainly need it when they go home, when on the weekends, and, on, and certainly during the summers when they go out for breaks. So Betsy DeVos, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, so about that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? Why Why is it? And because here's the thing, right? Everybody who works for Betsy DeVos down the, down the chain, they know what I just said. And exactly. they know it better than me. She doesn't. She's She can't relate. Right, right, she right, right, right. She, she is, is, you know, I guess some would say intentionally put there to not be able to relate to some of the needs that a lot of children have. But, you know, these kids, these same kids that are being killed in the streets could easily be the next president of the United States, easily be, you know, scientists and doctors. And we're just giving their lives away. And we're, we're, yeah, we're not, you know, taking advantage of their potential. Uh, That was a great point, though, about the the students and how they need curric- uh, activities to keep them mm-hmm. uh, moving. I love that Stimulating, point. Stimulating, absolutely. Amazing. Um, interesting, Puerto Rico, death toll. So initially it was said uh, by the White House uh, that there was a death toll of like 64, 65 people, which I thought... I was like, wow, they really did a good job with swooping in and preventing people because... I just could not fathom that number. But when people are pushing the number so hard, you know, you're Mm -hmm. like, what else? I don't have the statistics. I don't have the information. But then it all comes out that almost 5,000 people died in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Uh, Most of them due to the governmental negligence on part of the Trump administration. Um, Now... There are just so many things. There are so many things this. that are that are wrong with this, and I will tell you, being from Florida, where there's a large Puerto Rican population, we knew that wasn't true. Like the first week, because it, because people were calling their family members yes. and not able to get a hold of them. So when you think back to Hurricane Katrina and the numbers, the death toll kept rising because of the inability to respond in an effective way, um, and then the slowness of the response with Hurricane Katrina. You you have to, you have to like multiply that in Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico. It doesn't have the same infrastructure as the mainland. Yes. So, so the, yes, they are part of the United States. Those are American citizens. It is absolutely our responsibility to have Very much to, so. to take care of them and to make sure that that they are taken care of. Um, but they didn't have that. And on top of that, they had a a government who didn't respond. And so, yeah, so you do have homes being lost and a lot of people that were unaccounted for and. And even now, the, the they don't have power. <laughs> Let me tell you. I mean, you. which is rem- is stunning, right? It's totally stunning and baffling. Uh, I'm totally flabbergasted. Um, I just Jacob. Shout out to Jacob, who was our engineer. Thank hey, you, Jacob. Jacob, Jacob um, showed me uh, a chart that shows what the average time we spent talking about the Roseanne show and the cancellation versus how much media coverage they gave Puerto Rico. And this is it. So Fox News um, gave zero, zero hours, zero minutes, 48 seconds. You know what? And this is really important, everybody. And let me tell you why. Fox News, Fox is the largest network, television network in the country. They're bigger than the other two he's getting ready to talk about. So if they gave something 48 seconds worth of attention, that lets you know that their viewership, which is larger than the other two, only got that. If, if all I'm doing is turn on Fox every day and that's where I get my information from, 
I am in less inclined to prioritize something than if I'm again the the situation in Puerto Rico than if I'm watching CNN or MSNBC. True. I mean, just look at the contrast: twelve minutes and three seconds on CNN versus four hours and forty eight minutes. And this is the, the hurricane, and we're talking about up to now. That hurricane happened months ago. Months ago. And this is a comprehensive um, chart. It's. And that's that's really stunning when you I mean when you really stop and think about it. Now there may be regional networks that are giving it more coverage, like New York, where there's a large part Puerto Rican population. Mm-hmm. They're probably getting more coverage as to what's happening on the island. But nationally, that's really stunning that we would. And here's the other thing: the network that that you want to kind of keep in mind is that the networks will put on TV what you ask for, yes. right? So they they do listen to their viewers, and if their viewers want to know more about Roseanne, then they're going to ask. They're going to run more stories on Roseanne. If they want to know more about Puerto Rico, they're going to run more stories on Puerto Rico. So, you know, so as a citizen, and you thinking, gosh, well, what can I do? My heart's breaking for uh, Puerto Rico, but pick up the phone, send an email, fire off a tweet, do something, do something, do something. Um, so Serena Williams, yes. um, she went on a maternity leave. She came back in her Black Panther cat suit. Yes, she did. And it's so funny because the French Open, um, they entered her at number like 450. Mm-hmm. She was not seated as number one. Um, but she came through blazing, won her first match. Um, and people were talking about the suit, saying that, oh, it's fashionable, but actually that was for health reasons. For health reasons. Because of her blood clots. Because it allows of her, blood her clots. Yep, it allows her um, for circulation in her uh, legs and arms. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just not fashion. But she does look good while she's doing she it. She absolutely and does look good. And she just dropped good. that baby. And like, she just had a, a baby. Yo. She's amazing. And that's, and, and, and unfortunately, <laughs> that's why they seated her so low. They were like, She's not gonna be able to do anything. She just had a baby. But that's also misogynistic it because is. men who have children um, come aren't back to yeah work. come back where they were seated at. <laughs> yeah, they come back and where they, they hop right back. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I don't. I feel like it was quite misogynistic and not fair. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're running out of time. But I, I tell to... you what, success is the best revenge, everybody. Oh, yo, <laughs> I'm wearing that bell out too. Um, so uh, the last story we have: an 11 year old African American receives a full ride to. Southern University. All right. Fantastic. Shout out. What's his name? It's Dude. Elijah. Um, show the next picture. It's Elijah uh, Priestley. Priestley. A uh, homeschool student who already been taking classes at Southern University. Uh, he's going to start full time in the spring 2019. Um, shout out to Elijah. Right Yo, now. 11 years old. <laughs> homeschooled and yes. and and well you know what that really says a lot about his parents right they Very clearly so. recognize that their child has something special he's a child prodigy he's a child prodigy and they rather than saying you know we're going to just treat him like he's everybody else's kid we're going to give him what he needs to 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 thrive to and clearly he is soaring yo so shout out to elijah all right elijah let's yes. see what you do next can't wait for you to give the valedictorian speech on, on graduation day that's, that's right that's, it's gonna be yes, up there yes we love it and we're going to come we're going to take a quick break i'll pay these bills and we're going to come right back with stephanie mickle and all things mickle <laughs> stay tuned for more thursday night tea with anthony and stephanie <laughs> Oh my God, it's like I woke up and I was a comedian. And then it was like I had my own show. It's crazy.
Thursday, a Thursday, a Thursday, Thursday night tea. I said, it's Thursday, it's Thursday, it's Thursday, Thursday night tea. It's Thursday, it's Thursday, it's Thursday night tea. It's Thursday, it's Thursday, it's Thursday, Thursday night tea. Welcome back to Thursday Night Tea with Anthony and Stephanie. I even get to be part of the jingle. <laughs> Welcome to the show once more. Um, I saw you at Renee's show. Yes. Um, and your light was inviting. Um, yeah. yeah, you have a great spirit, great heart. I can just, you're, you. It, you just exude those things. Um, and I was like, I want her on my show. Now, your background, you went to Harvard, right? I did. I did. You want to talk, <laughs> talk a little bit about that? Yeah, now how yes, was that? I did. So it, it was phenomenal. Okay. And let me tell you why. I mean, the type of people that you meet there, the professors, the guest speakers, the subject matter, is, is it's Harvard for a reason. It's the top school in the world. It's number one. It's, uh, it challenges your thinking on so many levels. And for me, having the opportunity to go to Harvard and to study with people from all over the world, all different walks of life, was really very inspiring. Uh, and, to, and to have the opportunity to study public policy, which is my passion, uh, it, it just, it was, I could not have asked for a better experience. Was it hard? Absolutely. Did I work my butt <laughs> off every day, every hour? I earned every bit of that degree. <laughs> and so, yeah, but yes, it was, it was a really wonderful experience. And I definitely encourage everyone to consider it. And let me tell you why. Even if you think, okay, gosh, that sounds great, but I don't have the money. Harvard is one of the few places that if you've got the grades and you've got the background, financial aid isn't even an issue. That's awesome. They, 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 I don't think people know that. Yeah, no, people don't know that. And that's, I mean, I, I know the number used to be a, a family income of 40000 They may have increased it for inflation, but... That should not be a reason for you to not shoot for the moon um, and to really uh, consider that as an option for yourself. Valuable information, valuable information. Mm -hmm. So you graduated? I did. And then you went into? So then I went to work in, in the field of public policy. And when I first uh, graduated, I went to work in, a, in an arena called community development. What's community development? It's things like affordable housing. It's, it includes urban revitalization. It includes uh, encouraging small business development. Um, it, it's things like uh, roadways and streetways. So if you look out here on Georgia Avenue, there are certain parts of Georgia Avenue that are much nicer than others. <laughs> yes. That's because somebody has taken the time to do urban revitalization on the parts that are nicer than the others. Okay. And so there's a, there's a whole science and a whole industry around how you uh, encourage that type of development, how you work with local government leaders and community organizations and businesses and banks. And this is all public policy. And it's all part of public policy. Now, it's all actually a subset of public policy. Uh, it's called community development. But yeah, let's. I'm glad you asked that mm -hmm. because I want to take a step back and just say that public policy is basically how we think about, in an organized fashion, what kinds of policies and procedures we want to put into place for things that um, affect everyday lives. So that's health care, that's education, that's uh, crime and justice, that's banking, that's uh, international aid to foreign countries, um, that's things like air transportation and travel. Like the FAA has a whole policy department mm. that figures out where your flights are going, how frequently they need to go, how aggressive TSA needs to be with you. <laughs> you know, there's 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 um, people whose jobs it is to do the analysis around that. And they look at things like they look at the numbers, they look at the data and and they analyze that and then they make recommendations. And those recommendations are policy recommendations. OK, so um, from working in public policy, um, you because I in your um in your bio, it says all things Politico. Yes. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So I have uh, been a lifelong Politico. Uh, my grandfather was a Democratic block captain. Okay. And I adored my grandfather, so I wanted to be wherever he was, mm -hmm. doing whatever he was doing. And so, and one of the things that he did as a community leader 
was he would uh, encourage African Americans to vote when we first got the right to vote back in the 60s. Okay. He would interview candidates who wanted to run for office. They would come and meet with him and they say, you know, we need you to endorse us and go tell everybody else that we're a good candidate. He would meet before with them. Social media. Before social media. <laughs> long before, so, before yeah, social media. Putting that work in. He was, yeah, exactly. He was knocking on doors. He was endorsing candidates. He was uh, working with campaigns. And so I kind of by osmosis just started to learn and get excited about, about this area. And then as I got older and certainly went off to college, I started to take classes and better understand the the policy side, the science side of politics. And so for me, it started out in a, in a grassroots type of way. That's how I got introduced to it. I did an internship with the city manager who took me around and said, you know what? I got that stop sign put there. That was amazing to me. Internships are amazing. They are amazing. And, and I strongly encourage anybody, if you're even thinking that you might be interested in something, just do an internship. What's Shout out to our interns in here. Shout out interns right. in the house. Shout awesome. out. Yeah. Awesome. Hey. Put that work in. Put that and, work in. Absolutely. But that Absolutely. was important that he took you literally and showed you showed visual. Me. Visually. Visually. Yeah. It, it resonated for me in a different way than, you know, sometimes when you sit up and you read numbers all day, it doesn't really feel as personal. Mm -hmm. But if you can say there wasn't a stop sign there for years, so many people got into car accidents, and now there's a stop sign there and car accidents have gone down. There's there's proof that you did something good yes. that, that made a difference in a in a in a, a neighborhood. So tell us a little bit about your agency. Yes, so Mickle Public Affairs is a public affairs agency, and it's it's my company. I started about four years ago. Mickle Public Affairs is the business of politics, right? So, you know, everybody starts out and they say, I want to run for office. I want to get on the city council. I want to be on the school board. Then they have to figure out how they're going to get there. Like, they're going to need a team around them that's going to help them write their speeches, write their talking points, do research, help them figure out what their platform is going to be. Oh, my God. Listen, Stephanie, this is amazing. Now, for all of my friends and associates who, within the past six months, have said, hey, I want to run for office this is your go-to person. That's right. I mean, I've had so many of my friends, you know, just get energized about things that are going on in the community Wonderful. and things of that nature, and they want to begin to campaign and fill up some of these spots um, in politics where people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's fantastic. And they can come to you. Absolutely, they can come to us, and we'd be happy to, to work with you. We do fundraising, we do uh, political strategy, we advise candidates, we help you get your messaging, your branding together. We'll help you do the whole the, your whole campaign, absolutely, and would love to do that. Cause... Yeah, I know, I need my bail, I need my bail, my bail. <laughs> we'd love to do that, and, and I have to tell you, I love it when I hear people say that they're seeing what's going on and they're getting energized to take action. Yes. Because yes. this is not the time for anybody to sit on the sidelines. No, not at it's all. It's not. And, I, and, and I'm sure you hear that all the time where people think, oh, you work in politics. You think every time is the time for that. But I'm not kidding. Right. In the last 20 plus years that I've been doing this, things are very, very, very important at a very integral place mm -hmm. uh really uh we're at an intersection right here we're kind of at that crossroads of is the country going to maintain its place in the world as the number one country in the world the world superpower or are we not mm -hmm. and it's it is that serious and and you know you think gosh well i just you know i just work at the bakery i mean how, <laughs> what, what does that have to do with me it has everything to do with you everything everything to do with you because the freedoms that we have that mm -hmm. we enjoy that we take for granted that you know are in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they're being challenged. And they're being challenged in ways that we haven't seen in a long time. It used to be that we could take for granted that our leaders would follow the law. Let's just start there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we used to be able to take that for granted. Oh, it's so nostalgic. Right. It doesn't exactly. happen it's anymore. It's only been a year and a half, so... <laughs> Right. Yeah. But we but we can't do that. And let me tell you why that matters. Right. Because there have been times in the past, like, for example, African-Americans. Right. The 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments were passed right after slavery was abolished in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. But we then still had to have another law passed in the 1960s to guarantee African-Americans the right to vote. 
And that's because between the 1860s and the 1960s, people started doing things like creating poll taxes and literacy tests and uh, lynchings and other types of domestic terrorism to intimidate people out of their right to vote. So even though we became citizens, there's always been, a, and this is true with the women's movement too, a lot of women, you know, women got the right to vote after African Americans got the right to vote, but it was the same thing. It was, you, you really are only now starting to see women really begin to think about exercising their full authority, yes. even though they've had it for 80, 90 years. Because you have to break yourself out of that mentality. Yep. Like, do am I worth it? Do I deserve it? Because people tell you that you don't, don't. and you're not so yep. long. You have to kind of break out of that. Mm -hmm. And shout out to, what's the young lady um, in Georgia? Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams yes. got the nomination yes. for, yes. And I think she's going to go all the way. I think she's going to go all the way, too. Stacey, yeah. is, Stacey we were talking about um, the child prodigy earlier. Stacey is one of those people who was a child prodigy herself. And she was one of those people that people, I mean, I knew about her years ago. People would say, she's going to do something amazing mm -hmm. one day, like Barack Obama. He's going to be something amazing one day. You know, that, thank you. Um, that was... Um, really i think indicative of her as well and i would love to see are you kidding me i would love to see georgia have a black governor yes. other than peaches i want something other than peaches <laughs> to come out of georgia right. i mean Why i am not? awaiting got you so um we're running out of time okay now where can we find you if people want to come uh talk to you about maybe their um political career yes. budding yes. or uh, anything's political or public policy wise where can people get in contact with you well you can get in touch with me all sorts of ways social media is definitely the fastest way to get in touch with me um i have a mickle public affairs and my last name is spelled m-i-c-k-l-e public affairs has a facebook page which you can go to we also have an instagram page that you can go to and a LinkedIn page that you can go to. In terms of Twitter, my, my Twitter handle is Stephanie Mickle, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-M-I-C-K-L-E. Um, that's my website as well, stephaniemickle.com. And then lastly, I just want to put a quick no plug problem. in for yeah. my book. Yes, yes, the book. Yes. Can't leave out the book. Yes. And I think we have an image of it. Jacob, do we have, it says, uh, what's the name of it? Follow the Leader. Follow the Leader. I think we have it. Um, yep, there we go. Yes. By Stephanie Mickle. Right. So I have a new book coming out this summer. I definitely want to encourage everybody to pick it up. It talks about why more women should get involved in the political process, why you should not shy back from leadership. And, um, you know, and, and I have to tell you, there's a lot of men that are interested in the book, too. So I think that uh, it's going to yeah, be I'm really interested good. in the book. <laughs> I mean, is it, I'm not a woman, but I would love to gift it to, especially like my niece and mm -hmm. things that are to kind of inspire her and show her what she can be. Well, and, and to your point, one of the principles that the book uh, makes uh, makes clear is that leadership is not gender specific. Yes. So the principles that are in the book if, are for anyone who wants to step into doing something different to improve. All right, and where can they get the book when it comes out? Amazon, anywhere books are sold. Barnes & Noble, you name it. Good deal. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you so much for coming by and gracing us with your presence. Oh, You're you an so amazing much. person. You have an amazing spirit. Oh, uh, I'm super proud of your accomplishments. Wonderful. I'm definitely going to get your book, and I want an autographed copy. You got it. <laughs> um, Listen, absolutely. We could do something fun with the book. Yeah, absolutely. definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I will definitely have you back on the show when okay. the book releases. And we could right. talk about the book. Um, thank everyone for tuning in to Thursday Night Tea with Anthony and Stephanie. Hey. <laughs> Yo, I'll be at Fire Station One hosting with Starstruck Productions tomorrow. Come check me out, All Things Comedy, on uh, Anthony Oaks on Facebook and Anthony Oaks Comedian on Instagram and All Things Anthony Oaks. Just Google Anthony Oaks, O A K E S. Thank you guys for tuning in. Shout out to Listen Vision Studios, WLVS Radio. Shout out to Monica Livingston. Shout out to Renee yeah. um, for bringing us together Absolutely. the interns jacob the associate producer kevin thank you thank you jeremy and rahel we appreciate you all and thank you guys for tuning in tune in next week for more thursday night tea with anthony listen vision listen vision listen vision dc's number one recording studio oh. thursday night tea thursday night tea thursday night tea it's Thursday night tea with Anthony.